Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is the third of our five webinars to advance cooperative development. Um, the other upcoming webinars will be on real estate, real estate investment cooperatives and envisioning an equitable cooperative ecosystem. Recordings of the two previous webinars are on housing co-ops and on co-ops in the food supply chain are available on YouTube. Uh, please see the uh, chat functions for the links to those webinars. The USDA Cooperative Services Branch created a website in support of the Interagency Working Group on Cooperative Development. And Robbie, if you can advance the slide. You can see a picture of a, a screenshot of that uh, website. The site highlights partners in the support of cooperative development at the federal, tribal, state, and local and private sectors. Links include funding resources, development tools, publications and information, and some success stories. The website is very much a work in progress, so please visit the website and provide us with feedback um, information for improvement. Next slide, please. Here is an agenda <coughs> for, this, for today. Uh, first, we will have a welcome on behalf of USDA. Then we will have um, a representative of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve provide background on the child care uh, system, uh, current conditions going on. And then we will turn it over to look at cooperative solutions in providing child care. We will have two representatives from the cooperative community speak on uh, the overview of the child care co-ops and then a particular focus on work, worker ownership in child care. And then we will have a panel of federal resources for child care co-ops. We'll have an, a representative from the Administration for Children and Families and my colleagues at USDA Rural Development. And then finally, we will have some time for questions and your comments. Next slide, please. So next we will have uh, Dr. Neil, uh, Dr. Karama Neal. She is the administrator for USDA Rural Development, uh, our Rural Business Cooperative Services Branch, and she will share with us some opening remarks. Thank you so much. Um, we, I'm so pleased to have all of you here today. Really appreciate your willingness to come and talk about this really important issue. Um, is, as we noted, this is a gathering of people both within and outside of the federal government, and that is, that is what it takes to build a, a strong uh, child care community. As a working parent myself, the daughter of a single working mother, and the granddaughter of a child care provider, I have directly experienced the importance of affordable, quality child care for both the child, the working parent or parents, and the larger economy in the community. The 2014 Farm Bill authorized the Secretary of Agriculture, Agriculture to share this to chair, sorry, this working group to ensure the coordination on co um, cooperative development among federal agencies and private sector organizations. And we at the World Business Cooperative Service are honored to have such an important role in supporting cooperative development. This is because cooperatives generate jobs, bring needed go goods and services to people, especially when there are market failures and are resilient in economic downturns. Cooperatives can also create an ownership asset for the members, which is truly important, particularly in the sector. Cooperatives operate in all areas of the economy, as we know, agriculture, utilities, food service, energy, financial services, insurance, construction, housing, healthcare, and of course, child care and early childhood education, which we're here to discuss today. Cooperatives of all forms, we just heard a mention of worker cooperatives, but also producer cooperatives, consumer co-ops, remain an important form of business because their form facilitates resiliency and can weather such economic shocks. The level, this level of resiliency is particularly important given today's economic health and other shocks that we are currently in and may experience going forward. The member patrons of the cooperatives own, finance, use, and democratically control the cooperative. These financial benefits form the cooperative's main business, remain, within the member, remain with the member patrons in the form of patronage refunds, and so stay in the local community where the members live. Since the cooperatives are democratic organizations whose members have a voice in how the business is run, cooperatives produce creative solutions, particularly in times of crisis. In the case of worker cooperatives, members can change their operations or opt to take smaller paychecks rather than dismiss workers or go completely out of business. They can change how they market and, and move quickly to take advantage of new opportunities. 
These values and flexibilities allow cooperatives to fill market gaps, address community needs, and particularly those that might otherwise go unmet. So we've convened this meeting today to foster cooperative development and ensure coordination with federal agencies and national and local cooperative organizations that have cooperative programs and interests. We hope this group can seize this opportunity today to make programs across the federal government better known, better understood, more used, and bring people within and outside of government together for greater synergy in cooperative development, particularly in the child care and early education uh, sectors. We're excited for you to be here. We're excited to be here with you, and we look forward to this conversation. So now I'm pleased to welcome Benga Ajalor, who is a Senior Advisor for Rural Development, um, and so I'll turn it over to him. Benga. Thank you, Dr. Neal. I appreciate that. Um, if we could bring up the slides. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. I, have a, I appreciate being here uh, to talk about child care and child care issues. So, you know, given the group here, I don't need to go into too much detail about child care issues, but one of the things I kind of want to focus on is that, you know, we know that there's a lack of access to child care throughout the country and that the barriers when we talk about lack of access is not just monetary, but also the availability, because uh, especially if we look at it in a rural context. And so there was a recent study by the Bipartisan Policy Center that actually tried to quantify this child care gap, and they find that there's a child care gap of 31.7%. Well, what does that mean? Well, that number, what that number is, that 31.7% 31 of children below the age of six with all parents in the labor force come from families without access to for formal child care facilities. And so that's, you know, nearly a third of kids out there are not able to have formal child care facilities, which is, you know, which is problematic. And so in urban areas, that child care gap is 29%, in rural areas, 35%. And so, you know, but... The issue with child care, and this is why, you know, this, this uh, webinar with cooperatives is going to be very useful, is that it's not just the demand for child care that's an, at issue, it's also the supply of child care. So here we're talking about formal child care facilities, but we know that there's a lot of informal child care facilities, and, and but with some of those issues is that people who want to be in that child care sector, a lot of times there's not quality jobs. They're low pay, they don't have benefits, and there's a lot of difficulties in terms of being able to just, you know, have these facilities, have the kind of quality uh, child to be able to provide the ch quality child care uh, that people want to do. And so we have to look at it from both the demand issue side and the supply side. And so we also know that child care is very important for a strong and resilient labor market and for a vibrant community that we have strong child care facilities, we have strong quality jobs in that child care facilities. That's great for everybody. Go to the next slide. So Administrator Neil talked about the benefits of cooperatives in general and why they're, they're so good. And so as I talked about, there's both the demand side and the uh, supply side. And so one of the things that, and you're gonna hear more about during this webinar, is that you have early child care and education cooperatives can help build economic power. Individuals and worker cooperatives experience higher wages, less turnover, more sustainable jobs, and higher job satisfaction. So that we could, you know, set up these cooperatives to help, you know, do with the supply of child care facilities. Early child care uh, education programs can also be organized as multi staker cooperatives that <laughs> brings together groups, parents, and workers together that are most involved in children's well, well being. And so you have the decision making that's on both the parents and the worker side to be able to strengthen that. So you have the quality jobs on one side and the affordability on the other side and all together, you know, again, creating that strong, uh, viable community. And so, you know, again, I had, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. You're going to learn more, a lot more about these and how these work and just uh, looking forward to hearing more about this. And I'm going to pass it over to uh, Ben Horowitz now. Thank you. Oh, oh, very good. Uh, so before Ben Horowitz uh, speaks, thank you so much, uh, Karama. Thank you, Benga, for uh, the welcoming on behalf of USDA. Uh, so I wanted to just give a little uh, tee up to what Ben is going to provide. Um, he Ben is a senior policy analyst uh, at the Minneapolis Federal Reserve, and he will provide some introductory information about child care itself. It's interesting that the Minneapolis Federal Reserve has a history of research on the return on investment in high quality early childhood education. So without further ado, Ben. Thanks, Margaret. So as 
Margaret mentioned, I work in community development and engagement here at the Minneapolis Fed. So that means I have to have a, give a disclaimer here as a result. The opinions I am expressing here today are my own and don't necessarily reflect those of the Minneapolis Fed, the Board of Governors, or any other part of the Federal Reserve System. So for folks whose head is already spinning, maybe from all these references to different parts of the Federal Reserve, my next slide might help. So the Minneapolis Fed is one of 12 regional Federal Reserve banks spread across the nation. We're the ninth district, which is the gold colored swath at the top of the map here. I'm located in the Twin Cities, a metro that's home to about uh, three and three quarters million people. The next largest metros in our district have less than 300,000 people. So we've got 12% of the nation's land, but only 3% of its people. You can compare that to districts like New York or Philadelphia, where they've got something closer to 1% of the nation's land and five to 10% of the nation's population. So our districts are very diverse. Uh, the ninth district is very big and very diverse internally too, in just about every way you can imagine. We've got the Twin Cities, which is the 16th largest metro in the nation. When we travel in our district, we visit regional hubs like Fargo or Rapid City. We go to small towns with bustling main streets that have been revitalized by immigration. We meet with people from some of the wealthiest native nations on the continent and some of the poorest. Our boundaries contain boom towns and places that are struggling economically. So one of our jobs in my department is to understand how low and moderate income households specifically are able to participate in these local economies. We go around and we ask what's keeping low and moderate income households on the sidelines and how does the nation's current and banking infrastructure support the needs of different communities within our district. This work ties into our dual mandate from Congress to pursue stable prices and maximum employment and also into my department's specific function which derives from the Community Reinvestment Act. I wanted to give you all this context because I want you to understand how meaningful it is when I say that despite the miles and diversity contained within our district and the range of topics we cover and hear about, childcare almost always comes up in conversations with local community leaders. So on the next slide, um, you'll, you'll see a graph that shows that our exposure to stories about childcare isn't a coincidence. So regardless of where you're at, you're likely to find stories about childcare providers with long waiting lists and frustrated parents who have to organize their whole lives around accessing care. Just as one example, we traveled across North Dakota earlier this month and met with about 45 community development professionals. Among other things, we asked them about the biggest challenges for people that still struggle to find work in that state's red hot labor market and for employers that are looking to grow or sustain their business. Childcare was mentioned over and over again, whether we were meeting with housing developers or workforce development professionals. And in my six years at the Fed, I've heard about child care in some places you wouldn't expect, like a pork processing facility and just about everywhere else, like chambers of commerce roundtables and meeting spaces at regional banks, tribal colleges and hospitals. And people were talking about it before I got here, too. And a little bit like Mark, Margaret said, I'll talk about some work that my former colleagues did here at the Fed 20 years ago on child care that is still relevant today. That work was inspired by similar conversations in a world that hadn't yet experienced the Great Recession or the COVID-19 pandemic and the tragedy and disruptions those brought within the child care sector. So that pandemic only grew, diversified, and amplified the chorus of voices in our district, talking about the ways parents' child care challenges spill over into the economy as a whole. It's led to new conversations on the connections between child care and the labor market. And the increased visibility and intensity of child care challenges has led some of us at multiple Federal Reserve banks to form a cross-system working group on the topic. So if you aren't in my, my district, but you are curious about how the Fed might be involved in child care in your area, there's probably someone local you can talk to, and I'm happy to connect with anybody um, after this event. Uh, I think I forgot to put my email on the slides, but um, you can you can find it pretty easily on our website. So our working group has put together numerous informational resources on childcare over the years. I'll put in a quick plug for fedcommunities.org and our own website, minneapolisfed.org, which are good places to start if you're interested in these resources in more detail on what I'm, I'm skipping through today. So as I mentioned before, the pandemic inspired many people to focus on childcare in a new way. More people are seeing the way childcare impacts local businesses, but they're also starting to think of childcare as a business unto itself, which it always has been. I'm going to focus on four data points that are helpful for understanding the child care market. Then I'm excited to listen alongside you all to the perspectives of presenters who are going to talk about different approaches and resources available to address some of the issues I'll raise. So the next slide is a slide from a Benjamin that's all about the Benjamins. Uh, when people think of education, they often think of the K-12 system, which is largely financed by the public. Every parent in the nation expects access to a free public education system once their child is old enough. On the other hand, while there are public and nonprofit resources devoted to childcare, 
They're generally much smaller than the amount that is spent within the child care economy by parents. That's what this first chart here is about. It just drives home the point that the public sector is not funding the child care sector as much as that funding is coming directly from parents' wallets. Those working parents and guardians drive the demand for child care, and when that demand goes unmet, there are parents and guardians who want to work but can't. The next slide highlights a couple things to consider about the interplay between parents' work experiences and child care. So we know that most parents are employed or want to be. 94% of fathers are working or looking for employment, and two-thirds of mothers are in the same boat. While some parents certainly choose to stay at home, there's also a lot of evidence that when childcare access or affordability challenges a family, a mother is the one who is more likely to drop out of the labor force. Studies on childcare subsidy programs generally show that their availability increases labor force participation rates. So as childcare becomes more affordable and accessible, more people go to work. Figuring out the impact of the child care supply and employment is a little trickier than some of the other stuff I'll talk about, but the chart on the right is one of the approaches that I find convincing alongside the rest of the evidence. It simply shows that areas with a higher level of child care supply saw their labor force recover more quickly from pandemic disruptions. The chart on the left, meanwhile, shows that parents' labor participation decisions look different when children are at different ages. Simply put, it shows that parents work less and are paid less for the hours they do work when their children are younger. Part of the pay disparity is caused by the simple fact that parents tend to be younger. Though it doesn't always feel like our children do actually age at the same rate as we do. So by definition, you'll be older when your children are older. And as people get older, they tend to earn more money. But another big part of the equation is the child care challenges parents face. First, parents need to find child care that's available when and where we need it. Survey data tells us that parents make work decisions based on child care availability, and that can impact both how much they earn and how much they work. If you can find it, child care can be expensive. Federal child care subsidies serve about 15% of the low and moderate income children eligible under federally suggested guidelines. Other programs like Head Start are also unavailable to all eligible families. So there are some universal pre-K programs out there in some jurisdictions, but they largely serve three and four year olds. Everybody else is facing a market where the average parent pays about $11,000 per child per year, according to research by my colleagues at the St. Louis Fed, and that's for full-time care. That works out to about 15% of the median household income. How does the child care supply respond to this particular type of demand? Well, providers have to find a way to navigate parents' limited incomes while they're working in an industry where opportunities to innovate are rare. At the end of the day, one person can only care for so many children. And then there's the cost of finding and maintaining appropriate space, and that's just the beginning. So the next slide shows how central child care wages are to child care expenses, again, drawing on work from my colleagues at the St. Louis Fed. So this shows the relationship between the wages that child care workers are earning and the affordability of their services for parents. Even though parents feel like we're paying high tuition rates, providers themselves are operating on very narrow profit margins with low staff wages, high turner, and myriad other challenges. Add in the physical and emotional demands of the actual work of child care, and it's a little surprise that many child care providers we talk to or survey describe difficulties finding staff alongside high levels of stress and burnout. This chart shows that the labor intensive model of child care businesses means that you can't really increase staff wages without also challenging affordability for parents. So the final slide here is a pitch on why this is important, even if you don't particularly like children. Um, we always say this is for Scrooge before he um, has his Christmas revelation. So about 20 years ago, economists at the Minneapolis Fed were hearing similar conversations about child care as we're hearing today. And they started looking to evidence on returns on public investments in high quality early childhood education. So some academics had the foresight to plan for research like this. Um, so I emphasize for the public here on this slide because the benefits of high quality early childhood education don't just accrue to the family that's able to participate in it. The kids who are in stable, supportive, and nurturing environments benefit from the impacts of that environment well into adulthood. But the benefits to the public are also worth noting, which is what we, we like to highlight. So the original paper was based on experimental designs that, like I said, stretched back um, into the 60s. Thanks to those forward-looking academics, we're now seeing signs that high-quality early childhood development can actually benefit three generations, parents, their children, and their children's children. 
This chart shows how the children of the now adult former preschoolers from one high quality early childhood program are faring relative to some of their peers whose parents did not get access to that program because of capacity limits. And you see that the same sort of benefits that were experienced by the, the now parents when they were kids are, are continuing to show up in the data. So each of these outcomes is obviously great. For the two generations of children who stayed in school longer, avoided interactions with the criminal justice system, and had more success navigating the job market. But again, it's also great for the public that invested in their early childhood education, because when a child needs fewer supports in the K-12 system, or when they're less likely to grow up and access the social safety net, and when they're more likely to grow up and earn more money, it means the public is spending less on the safety net and gathering more in um, tax revenues. So our math shows that when you compare the initial investment in these kids to the net benefit in a purely dollars and cents um, framework for the public over the lifetime of the kids, that ben those benefits far outweigh the original investment and beat most other investments you could possibly imagine. So I hope I've done a good job laying out the challenges in the market today and giving you a sense of why this is an important issue, not just for individual families and children, but also for employers and the communities they jointly create. I'll hand it back over to Margaret now so we can all learn about exciting opportunities to support child care from, from our other presenters here today. Very good. Thank you, Ben. And that is so helpful to get that overview of the conditions in uh, uh, facing us with child care, but also from an economic perspective. So now we are uh, going to hear a panel of two people to talk about from a cooperative perspective and how the cooperative model can be used to help provide solutions for the provision of child care. First up, we have Kim Coons, who is the executive director of the California Center for Cooperative Development. Kim is, is viewed as the expert when it comes to child care cooperatives. She's been working in this field for many years, and, and she really has a handle on some of the issues and has worked hands-on with a number of different child care co-ops. Uh, she has actually written several guides and books on the topic. So uh, without further ado, I turn it over to you, Kim. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen here. Um. Please let me know if things are not working quite right. So I'm just going to repeat um, basically some of the things that um, that have already been presented about this crisis. So I'll go really, really quickly so that um, we can spend uh, more time talking about some uh, specifics about the solutions. Um, basically, as um, uh, previous uh, Ben and uh, ben got uh, shared. We have this shortage of care, um, and we have this affordability issue. Um, the you know you can look at this affordability in different ways, and um, these are median figures for um, for the specific ages. But basically, childcare um, is among each household's highest income. The average is about 18%. Now that's gonna vary a lot if you have a couple of kids that you're paying uh, childcare for. And these ranges that I have for the different uh, age groups, the infants, the toddlers, and the preschools, I, I don't know how they got them. I, I um, was just yesterday talking to one of our staff members who's uh, coming back from parental leave and his review of child care for his um, nine month old was $3,000 a month. That was the most economical that they could find. That's pretty high. That would amount to $36,000. So you can imagine these medians are telling us, and these are uh, figures from the U.S. as a whole, but it gets very expensive, particularly for, uh, for infants. And you can see it goes down a little bit if, as we have care for uh, for toddlers and preschools, and I can tell you why that happens in a minute. Um, basically, the other problem also that's been shared is this inadequate amount of subsidy for parents. We don't, it's mostly this is a, a private sector phenomenon. We do have some programs at the federal level and at the state level, but it, they are very, very inadequate to meet the needs of people that, who are eligible. Um, so it's uh, basically only about 13% of eligible households receive the subsidies that they would qualify for. 
And then we have the crisis that's also been shared on the worker side, and I'll just go through this really quickly. First, who are these workers? Well, most of them are women. 52% um, are, are moms and 40% are people of color. And then let's look at um, that work, uh, the workforce. There's about uh, 15 million people in um, this profession. And the pay and benefits are very low. Um, in fact, child care is among the lowest paid positions you can go into. People go into this field because they love kids and they love that kind of work. But there, we have, can't overlook the fact that there's a racial gap. Even within these wages, people of color tend to be at the lower end of that wage gap. If we look at teachers, um, let's think about uh, there are a lot of regulations around what the definition of a teacher is in a child care arena. Most states require that a teacher be um, have a bachelor's degree, and yet the average wage is $18 an hour. The range is about 15 to 23. Uh, if we look at child care assistance, which, which also have education requirements, the average is about $14 an hour. And those assistants are earning anywhere from $12 to $17 an hour. It's a pretty stark reality of the of this situation, but let's look at what that translates to in terms of their of their living standards. 15% live below the poverty line. 37% um, of those are are. 200% below the federal poverty line and only 15% have ins health insurance coverage. So it's a pretty, uh, a, a pretty sad state of affairs. Not surprisingly, this translates into some things that we find in the child care arena that really affect children and families, which is this fragile workforce. People can't afford to stay in these positions many times when they can earn the same or more by working at a fast food restaurant. Sometimes they have to um, have to go for that. This causes a, a lot of turn over in the um, in the workforce. So it's, uh, the range is 26 to 40 um, percent. Are those that those are the average turnover rates? But in some areas, the turnover rate can be as high as 70 percent. Now, if you think about what that means for children, that means that um, kids are not having the same teacher, the same person that's caring for them at the beginning of the year, uh, by the middle of the year or the end of the year, which is really, really hard on young children. So I want to really spend a minute looking at the econ economics of child care. Again, this has also been covered, so I'm repeating it and hopefully we'll get a good view of why this is such a crisis. Um, so we have regulations uh, in every state, and I have to say that a lot of progress. When I started working in this arena, uh, did anyone want to tell you how long ago that was because it was so long ago? Um, the issue was trying to make sure that we had quality care for children. Now, most states, um, because of those efforts, have very good regulations, but those same regulations that keep children safe also have to do with the economics, with the uh, with the um, the fact that it's, it can be so expensive and that that expense basically is borne on the backs of the workers in those child care arenas. So the most significant of these um, regulations is the child to adult ratio. So the best way in a capitalist economy to save money is to uh, economies of state scale. Oh, let's just have a whole bunch of kids and very few adults. And of course, that would really erode the quality of care and not make it too pleasant for anyone in that situation. The other kinds of things that um, that are involved in the regulations are, you know, sizes of toilets and inside and outside space per child and so forth, which are also really important and and can um, make it harder to uh, to make it inexpensive. So we have this uh, economic balancing act. Basically, there's a limit to what parents can pay and costs in these situations are typically controlled by underpaying our, our the caregivers. And this balancing act um, really um, requires some ways to look how can we minimize these costs and maintain the quality. And so what we what I really want to focus on with David is really looking at how cooperative models can address these issues. So we can look at a, a number of creative options um, in cooperatives. And as we know, cooperatives really 
um, what we look at is who the members are. That's that, that's what determines who the focus in, who the decision makers are in these different models. So membership types, there's really four of them. One are the parents, where the parents of the of the um, children in the program are the members. Another one can be workers who um, the uh, the workers in the program have run the business and have the child care business. Employers are also another membership type that we find in this arena. What I'm going to really advocate for and what I have been in this uh, in my writing is a multi stakeholder, which is a combination of all these. Um, as I'll explain, all of these groups share really acute uh, need for child care, quality child care, and um, by cooperating, cooperating together, they can really have the best circumstances to meet the needs of each individual group. But let's first, you know, kind of cover these different uh, the structure and so forth of these models. So um, first, let's just look at the corporate structure. And this is that a, and I'm going to focus on child care centers. David's going to talk uh, about child uh, family home uh, care. I'm only going to focus right here in my discussion on those child care centers. So um, the child care center incorporates as a charitable nonprofit and operates as a as a cooperative. The membership still means democratic governance, according to those membership groups. The board of directors, just like any uh, co-op, establish the policies and the board hires and oversees um, an executive director or just a director is usually in the um, in the regular regulations. That's usually the director. And then that director, of course, is um, implementing the policies set by the board, managing the day to day operations and hiring and supervising teachers and those uh, assistants in the child care program. So I want to spend a, a minute talking about the nonprofit status because I um, have been, you know, advocating for programs to incorporate it as uh, as a nonprofit and operate it as a nonprofit and use these statutes rather than co the cooperative statutes um, uh, because I think it's to the advantage of the program. My opinion is that um, cooperatives are not defined by by the statute that people incorporate under. Operate under. It's hopefully I don't know if uh, that sound was affecting everybody. So see, um, please let me know if, uh, if hopefully you're okay. Stopped. Go right ahead. Thank okay, you. thank you, thank you. So um, the Internal Revenue Service defines child care as education, and there have been some significant lawsuits that have established this in the child care arena. So because of that, most child care cooperatives can qualify for exempt status um, if they use the nonprofit corporate statute in their state. Um, and what I was about to say is that I think that a cooperative is defined more by how we operate than by the statute that's used. And that can be explained too by we have states that have no statutes for cooperatives, but we still have cooperatives. So I really recommend we're trying to uh, address a situation where the bottom line is really, really tight as we've been learning. And so we want to do everything we can to lower the costs, um, operating costs. And if we cannot pay taxes, that's uh, a really, really significant way to minimize the costs. Um, there are um, some things that you need to watch out for. You can't have a majority of members in the cooperative that have a financial interest. Um, the advantage of uh, having a charitable nonprofit, of course, is that you don't have to pay taxes. Um, in California, uh, the minimum tax for uh, any uh, corporation and including cooperatives is $800. That seems like a really low amount, but when you're talking about that really, really fine line, it's still uh, it's still an expense. And then there are some things that they may still have to pay taxes on above that. Um, that charitable status makes the child care center eligible for grants and for tax deductible uh, donations. Again, members are still uh, governing the uh, cooperative de democratically. There can be no distribution of profits. Hey, no worries. There's no profits there usually. So uh, members again receive service at cost and that's still the focus of the um, of the using this statute incorporating. So, well, let's get to why a co-op. 
we could just have a nonprofit, right? Just uh, incorporate as a nonprofit. Why do a, a co-op? And I think really if we're looking at a program that's going to best fit the needs of members, again, employers, parents, the worker, um, a cooperative's best situated to do that. So we can also reduce the cost of that care while ma maintaining quality. Um, we know that caregiver attributes are really, really important. We want people who have experience and education in the needs of children. Those are really important. Um, we want to pay attention to the ratio of uh, the child per caregiver, and we want to make sure that it's developmentally appropriate. We know that those are the things that go into a, a quality program. We want stable, reliable, care and we want a program that's good for kids. I want to say another thing that really makes the co-op model particularly good for in child care is you have more stakeholders with increased interest when they're making the decisions in the program. So um, I'm going to talk just go into these different models and just kind of uh, do a little bit of more detail in these models. The parent cooperative where the parent is the member of the cooperative is really the most common form of child care cooperatives and they've been around a very long time. They date back to um, parent preschools and the rec recognition of um, the importance of early childhood experiences. You know, co-ops don't happen in a vacuum and so uh, around the 1920s, this is when we started to realize that early education with uh, with children is really, really beneficial. And so um, Catherine Whiteside Taylor was a professor and she really Really wanted programs for children, especially she thought it would be good for moms also to have a little bit of free time and the and to have education and she thought this is a really good way to do that. And so that's really the origins of the parent model and this uh, really um, grew very quickly across the United States. Um, so we find associations and so forth. The members in this situation are parents who democratically govern the center. Traditionally, this has mostly been women, but we have a lot more uh, parents also being involved, uh, both parents and grandparents and gar uh, guardians uh, serving that membership role. And then they hire the uh, child care director uh, to leave, lead and over, um, oversee the center. Parents often volunteer time in these uh, in these centers and that um, to some extent uh, lowers the cost, but it also improves the quality of the care that children get. And really what you get in these centers is this community of parents and teachers in which everything is really focused on the child. What we found in these parent cooperative and also what we find is that we have a low teacher turnover in these programs. I'll talk a little bit more about this in, uh, in a little bit because you improve that uh, reciprocity of parents and and educators and focusing on the children and you also have then a lot more concern for what people are being paid and the working conditions in the in the centers. So I want to give an example. Um, Hilltop Nursery School um, was founded in 1951. This actually started out as a, a preschool program in a park just for, as a nursery school in Los Angeles. Um, and as the times have changed, a lot of these programs that were just were nurse focused on being nursery schools grew and that's what happened at Hilltop is their the model morphed to the needs of the parents at Hilltop now they have a uh, they still have the park but they have a huge beautiful um, center that serves 44 children that are aged two and a half to five years old in a program that operates providing care from seven in the morning to to six at night at Hilltop, um, again, the parents are, are setting the policy and so forth and directing that. They establish it's very, very important to them to have a, a program that's diverse ethnically and economically. So they actually have um, established by a sliding fee scale. They get grants on top of any subsidies that um, that parents might be able to qualify for. And they also um, have a donation program that allows for a, a sliding fee uh, scale that will allow that diverse economic diversity in the program. They also have part time and full time options. This is something that you find in co-ops that uh, is different in other uh, child care centers. Um, 
nonprofit and and for profit usually the options that are available to parents are oh you can have uh, half day care which would be from uh, whenever the program starts to midday or you can have it on the other end you can have a part day program that operates on uh, uh, midday to the closing of the program well most parents have uh, might have a program if they if they don't need full day care, the timing of that, maybe an overlapping of a parent or guardian uh, taking care of kids or other things that allow or a work schedule that is more diminished, allow for them to have part time care. They can save on the expenses. What we have at Hilltop and a lot of the co-ops is that part time care has a lot more flexibility in the time uh, in the time that people can use. So they're more likely to pay for the time that they need rather than a, um, a section of time that they do don't uh, that they won't not when their child will not be in the program at Hilltop also they have um, requirements for parent participation every family they have a family uh, evening meeting once a month the entire all the family has uh, a meal and then the children are cared for and the parents have a have a meeting uh, and that's once a month uh, parents are expected to volunteer 12 hours a year in the program and they're expected to participate in one fundraising activity. Well, how that's really hard for working parents, no doubt about that, but at uh, Hilltop, their philosophy is that we really want to create a community here and the community is around the children and we want to get to know one another and this is how we we're, we um, feel it's important to do and the parents that attend the program this is their recreation also and their interest so um, this is a quote um, that kind of uh, exemplifies this other idea of strengthening families through the program at Hilltop. With family members involved, the transition to, from home life to uh, school life is easier. A child's self-esteem is boosted, and both parents and child uh, develop a dynamic learning relationship that carries over into the future. And we saw some of the st statistics previous, previously shared really bear that out. Um, I started my co-op career at um, UC Davis, an extension program, um, a center for cooperatives there, and I was hired to uh, to work with child care. So I'm kind of that's how I began my career in uh, in co-ops, and I uh, did a lot of work with. Uh, starting co-ops and also with helping co-ops that were established to grow their program, extend their uh, uh, programs to offer full-time child care. And I would get a lot of inquiries and there was there were very few resources. And so I wrote this book that was published in 2003 to kind of address that. So it's, it's not a page turner particularly, I got to say, but it has a lot of information um, in it. There's stuff on how to start it and then information that serves as a resource for those programs. Uh, uh, the pro existing programs uh, in the pro and the questions that I got a lot and so that's what really what I was trying to do it with this book is to address that and one chapter is really heavy on the research because I wanted people to be able to write grants to articulate why a co-op is good there's a lot of research on parent involvement and its linkages to positive outcomes for children and uh, Ben really addressed a lot of a, a lot of that what we find is a reduced um, uh, parents involved in a variety of different ways in their children's lives can lead to um, decreased chances of kids getting involved in the juvenile justice system reduced uh, early uh, early age pregnancy rates um, a lot of really really positive uh, things that we're able to control for economics and see these economic uh, outcomes um, and then I did also research while I was at UC Davis about uh, parent pre, uh, the co-ops that were in existence. I did a extensive survey um, asking them a lot of uh, different questions and asking questions also of the people that work there and really was it really the, the my work and the survey really show that parents really learn in these caregiving situations in the co-ops. They learn from the teachers by being involved in the program in a really uh, effective way and those uh, positive relationships bringing the children and the parents and the caregivers together just is a positive for everyone. Uh, also found that we had a lot of that community aspect that you find uh, that we found 
being emphasized and and nurtured at Hilltop really comes out to those lasting bonds. And also the caregiver turnover rate in the co-ops was very, very low when I did the survey. It's way less than half percent of what you find elsewhere. So then we have um, employers are also these child care stakeholders um, and what we find are benefits to these employers. Uh, child care uh, recruitment is increased, retention is increased, we have reduced absenteeism among uh, among workers when you have child care, um, it boosts company loyalty, it increases job satisfaction, and you find actually increased uh, productivity and there's research supporting all that. There, I want to just share a little bit about a couple of programs. Um, GeoKids is actually a federal, um, these are federal employees in Men Menlo Park, California. The, actually, this program was initiated by the parents. They wanted an on-site program for their kids. They provide uh, six months through four, uh, eight in the morning to 6 uh, p.m. at na night. And the parents get reliable quality care, convenience, community, peace of mind, and the employer gets that enhanced recruitment, retention, and reduced absenteeism. So uh, on this, the uh, the parents are the majority of the board. There's one employer rep. Um, the employer pro provides the space and low reduced rent. Uh, the parents pay for um, pay for the care. They require participation. And this is a quote from a parent. The real advantage is that my office is just two minutes walk from the center. Because it's a cooperative, we have a good knowledge of all the teachers and other parents. We know their children and they know us. And it's a real we're a real resource for one another. So in uh, Sometimes parents, uh, uh, a center, an employer is not big enough to provide uh, care on site or near site care for their employees. In this case, they can join together with other em employers. This can also op overlap with the parent model. This is a great strategy for employers that otherwise for economics or parent population are, other, are unable to provide this service. Uh, employers are able to share both the risks and the benefits and this is rarely free but the combined ep efforts of the um, of the employers uh, can help reduce the cost. They can provide maybe a rent free site, utilities, bookkeeping, accounting services, maybe meal services is if it's a, a medical facility or other facility that provides meals anyway, provide it to the kids, equipment sharing and also benefits. They might uh, extend the benefits for all the workers to the child care workers at the child care center. Um, I want to just briefly, I'm running a little bit low on time. This is a, a frequently referred to um, great program in Hazen, North Dakota. I was involved in helping start this. Hazen had no licensed child care. They had unreliable care. And so um, eight employers got together to create Energy Capital Cooperative. They purchased a low uh, local church that opened in 2017. This program is licensed for 88 children aged infant through school age. It operates from seven in the morning to five at night. In this case, the employers, the the um, uh, the site is very, very low cost. The church was very happy that it went to a good cause, their, their um, church that was needed to close. Um, this, the employer subsidized the director, K, uh, director salary and benefits, and they commit to covering uh, spaces for their employees, and they serve along with parents on the board. The worker cooperative model is, David's going to go into that. The only thing I want to say is that uh, in the worker cooperative model, it's they're ineligible for tax exempt st status because um, of the, um, if, they're, if it's completely workers, they need to, they can't have a direct um, dividends and uh, advantages to the employers. So this is why it's important to include employers, parents, and teachers. Increase that stakeholder engagement. Embrace that partnership that I talked about earlier. Draw on the legacy of the parent co-ops, um, and or it will be organized as a charitable nonprofit, where 51% plus are the uh, parents and employers. The focus is on the synergy of um, nurturing children and addressing the child care. Um, one uh, example of this program is the Children's Center at Stanford University. This started in 1969, one of those really early programs um, that was a preschool. It's now grown to having 210 children, infant through uh, age five, and um, they have both uh, um, teachers and parents on the board. 
but 51% are disinterested parties, so it qualifies for that non-profit status. Um, the parents contribute four hours per quarter to the program, and the success of the program prompted the university to to uh, have to build a larger facility, and this is part of the whole campus. Outside people are also allowed to um, to enter the program, and that's what made it so that they could care for 210 um, kids. So just in summary, I just want to say these are the operational facts. All quality child care centers have high operational costs. For optimum effectiveness, child care centers offer um, operate at cost, and then um, the unused slots. Um, are costly, so you always need to have a full program. That's why I always say don't limit um, who can come to the program. And including, include, increasing this diversity uh, in membership really maximizes the effect effectiveness for the employers, for the parents, and for um, the teachers. And I just want to say there's more resources on our um, on our website. Um, I worked with some other people to create this California Cooperatives landscape, and there's one section on um, child care cooperatives. So thank you. I'll stop sharing. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Kim. That was fantastic and a great overview of the flexibility of the cooperative model and how it's being used in various situations. Now we're gonna have David Hammer. He's the executive director of the ICA group, and uh, he is going to present information more on the employee, uh, in the worker side of things. Um, in particular, uh, taking a look at home-based childcare uh, along with the childcare workers themselves. So David, take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Margaret. Um, and uh, thank you, Kim, for uh, what an amazing setup. Um, uh, was that was really incredibly helpful. Um, uh, and Ben for for for, for setting the facts, the, the the baseline for this. So I just you know want to appreciate everybody. Um, uh, so as Margaret said, I'm the executive director of the ICA Group. We're a national not-for-profit consulting firm focused on um, worker ownership. Uh, our mission is to change the nature of work by advancing businesses and institutions that center worker voice, grow worker wealth, and build worker power. And we have, we do that, um, uh, one of the ways we do that is we focus on particular industries. And one of the industries that we we focus on is child care and trying to create um, more worker ownership in the space of child care. Um, I will say, you know, referencing what Kim was talking about, I'm going to be talking about kind of like worker owned companies here. But I think with all of these like all of these strategies, um, uh, like as Kim said, you know, the, this notion of the multi-stakeholder cooperative can fit into this. So this is not an exclusively a um, you know a, a worker you know just solely worker ownership piece. Um, and I'm really going to talk about two areas. So one is going to be about um, kind of childcare center conversions, and the other around family childcare. So it's a lot to cover. So I'm going to go quick. Highlight here: people have talked about the challenges. Um, uh, facing the childcare industry, I want to just sort of talk about two two key things here that references. One is that the formal childcare workforce is actually shrinking. Um, we have a situation where the um, the the childcare industry is not growing at the pace in which it's really necessary. Um, and I think the other piece that's sort of worth noting noting here is around that owner retirement. Um, has a big impact on the national decline in licensed childcare centers. Um, and when we talk about conversions, I think it's an important thing to note that um, baby boomers started turning 75 in 2021. That was the first year of the baby boomers turning 75. Um, 10,000 baby boomers turned 75 every day. Um, and that's going to continue until 2039. Um, the majority of business owners, especially small businesses like childcare centers are baby boomers. Um, and so as they retire, right, the question becomes, what do they do with that business, right? Do they sell it um, or do they just close up shop? And in, what we find is that in too many cases, people are just closing up shop. And that actually what that does is it eliminates childcare capacity from the, um, uh, from the space. So when we look at kind of both you know, child care center conversions, we think about that both as like a way to build wealth and power and improve job quality for child care workers, but it's also a way to help um, child care provide child care, you know, business owners and the communities. Um, 
as you go to the next slide, um, we talk about uh, in our work in you know in in addressing you know the, using childcare conversions or worker ownership conversions as a way to um, support you know, childcare businesses. It's really kind of taking on these sort of these are kind of the things that we're really thinking about, right? One is responding to owners, um, you know, owners who, as you know, especially as um, there's a lot of financial uncertainty. And you're an older, you know, older business owner. The idea of taking on debt, or the idea of, um, you know, kind of making the, you know, investment in in in, in a company is quite difficult. Um, because the return on investment is a is a short period of time. Um, we also want to make sure that we're creating pathways for owners, those retiring owners who are looking to get um, out of this in a way that can ensure their legacy and support their their business. And on the worker side, this is really about like. Engaging workers around saving jobs, right? Um, engaging workers around, like you know, making sure that these jobs are saved, but also uh, making sure that the quality of those jobs um, uh, improve, and so we can, you know, retain them. I think it's worth noting a thing here is that um, so ICA has a, an affiliated loan fund called the Fund for Jobs Worth Owning, and the reason we call it the Fund for Jobs Worth Owning is because just because you own your job doesn't mean it's a good job. It makes it a better job, but it doesn't make it a good job yet. Um, and so if you're a childcare worker and you own a job that pays you, you know, slightly above minimum wage with no benefits um, and no, you know, an enormous amount of precarity because of the of the industry, you own a, you know, you own a pretty lousy job. Um, what we need to be working on is, you know, both like trying to address the challenges that are facing these folks, you know, through transforming these jobs into worker-owned jobs, but also working to address some of the policy address issues um, to, you know, to combat some of the these endemic problems. So it's a both and uh, approach. And I think in our approach at ICA, one of the things that we really focus on is not just thinking about the firm, not just thinking about the company, but working to try to build networks to address some of those endemic and systemic problems. We'll talk more about that with the, when we talk about the family child care work, especially. Um, so the next slide talks about um, how we think about kind of our process to help a business go through this conversion. And so I'm going to talk you know, briefly about kind of two conversions that ICA has worked on. Um, but the way that we we sort of take folks through a five step process um, as we're thinking about a business owner looking to see what's happening. The first is really establishing what are their goals? What is that owner's goal, right? Are they looking to sell the company and leave? Are they looking to sell a company and stay? Are they looking to sell all of the company? Are they looking to sell part of the company? Um, what do they need in terms of the, you know, what are their financial needs in terms of retirement? Um, and what can, you know, and 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 how can this play a, a, a role in the, you know, um, a role in that? Really understanding that a, con a transition from a conventionally owned or an individually owned childcare center or any business to become a worker owned center um, requires that the selling owner wants to do it, right? So the first step we do is really figure out like, what is that owner looking to do? Right. And that's not a long process, but it is a process really trying to like hone in what are the things that that person wants to achieve. Then once we have a sense of that, what we do is that we look at really like, OK, how does that work? And so that's for us is really three parts. One is figuring out the value of the company and then figuring out the financial feasibility of the company buying itself and the operational feasibility of whether the company has the capacity to um, uh, uh, to you know, exist after the after the transition um, has happened, and so that'll often look at, you know, if an owner's looking to leave, is there the um, the the staff in place to take over, or you're going to have to bring somebody, you know, bring somebody in to you know to um, to replace them, or you're going to have to spend some time training folks up to do that. Um, so it's really just doing kind of the 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 math and the assessment to figure out like is this thing a possible you know is this process a possible um, you know is it is it feasible is it possible can we get the financing can we you know can we figure out a way to make this thing work um, once we've sort of done that then we can really say okay we think this is something that's worth going forward we're going to bring it to the employees we're going to bring it to the broader community we're going to bring it out. Um, and really try to make this thing work. That's where we get into this planning the transition. And that's really when we start figuring out how to build out governance systems. We start involving lenders and figuring out the financing things of that. 
Um, and the planning, the transition, and the completing the transition, um, you know, one is sort of coming up with a plan, which is really building out all of the kind of what is the financial, you know, uh, transition going to be? What is the, what is the, you know, what kind of banking we're going to need? Um, but then we really are, you know, moving into like, how do we get that, you know, that transition completed? And then after that, it's operating as a worker owned company, right? Um, so this is kind of our process. It takes some time. Um, and I want to talk about two examples of this. Um, so the next slide talks about the Rose Garden. The Rose Garden is a company that converted to employee ownership. Um, oh, I wish I had, I should have written this down, um, but about uh, seven years ago. And this is, this quote is from the, um, from the, the selling owner. Um, and, you know, really this was the situation where the, you know, the, the owner was looking to sell the business. Her daughter didn't want to buy the whole business. It didn't sort of work. And they said, well, what if we looked at this? What if we looked at selling to the, you know, to all the employees? Um, and so that was a process that really worked for that selling owner. They got to achieve what they want. It worked for the sort of the next generation owner who didn't want to take on the responsibility of the company solely. Um, and it created a pathway for folks to, um, you know, to own their job and to work on um, in trying to create, um, you know, a better job, a better job for themselves. Um, and they've been going, um, you know, they they converted a number of years before the pandemic. Um, had a difficult time, as as folks, anybody's familiar with the childcare industry. The pandemic was incredibly challenging for the childcare industry. Um, if we look at sort of the industry and we sort of take away the PPP loan program, we'd probably be looking at an industry that doesn't exist anymore. That most, you know, lots of childcare centers um, are only here um, uh, because of um, you know the subsidies that they were able to get. Um, so they had it, you know, they they struggled, you know, just like everybody else through the pandemic, um, but made it through and have, you know, reopened um, uh, um, and are doing you know, doing quite well today. The next slide talks about a more recent conversion um, uh, out of um, Wisconsin, out of Milwaukee, called Nestling House. And here this quote is from Lauren, one of the worker owners there. Um, and, you know, she talks about how um, not only is it sort of, you know, allow the, you know, the staff members opportunity to co in the business and make collaborative decisions, um, but the, you know, this idea of like when you send your child to Nestling House, you will know the teachers want to be there because it's more than just a job, it's a community. This really kind of, I think, encapsulates kind of why the, um, why the, the sort of this, this idea is, um, uh, you know, can really be valuable. And, I want to before we transition into co-rise um, and the sort of talking about family child care, I do want to sort of name that one of the challenges with child care conversions, there's an enormous need and demand for this. But one of the real challenges with the child care conversion program is that child care centers tend to be pretty small. And as folks have said, child care centers have really low margins. So these companies are not worth a ton of money. Right, the value of the business is not worth a ton of is not worth a lot is not that much, but because these childcare owners are also not making a ton of money, being an owner of a of a you know the the need for that you know that money to make their retirement secure is even greater than in other situations. So the financial pressure on the transaction is really significant, um, and to be frank, the cost of helping a company transition through this is not insignificant. And so there is a real, we really see that there's a huge need for this. There's a real demand for this. Um, and it's, you know, worker ownership transitions can be a real way to shore up the child care industry. Um, but it's not something that is, um, you know, there's an obvious market for. Um, and so there really is a market failure there um, in terms of child care owners being able to afford to pay for these services. Um, uh, so A, they're not aware of it, but B, even if they are aware of it, it's quite difficult for them to cover those costs themselves. And so we really are looking at this as like from a public policy perspective and from a philanthropic perspective, we really think this is something that requires some, you know, some pretty significant subsidy to help, you know, support this work. Um, so on a transition here, next slide, talk about CoRISE Cooperative. CoRISE Cooperative is a cooperative um, based out of Chicago, Illinois. Um, it's a it's a it's a cooperative of family child care providers. So these are licensed providers who operate a child care center inside or child care um, uh, location inside their own home. Um, so they tend to be smaller. Some folks have assistance. Some folks do not. Um, 
And the challenge with family child care providers face is that they are essential, but they're really not supported. Um, some examples of how that unfolds is um, there'll be required in-service trainings um, that people have to attend. And those services will be offered during the day. Well, if you're a child care center and you are the owner and you are the only person to attend that training requires you to shut down your child care center. Um, so you have to tell your, the children and the families you're caring for, we're not going to be around. We can't you know, we can't do this. So we've got to attend this training um, and you're not going to get any revenue for that. Right. There isn't the same kind of flexibility that a center has because it tends to be a single person. Right. Or two people um, and there's not backup. Right. So. Those are some examples. Another another kind of example that we have that sort of is a you know a key indication of, of some of these challenges is that family child care centers oftentimes will or family child care providers oftentimes will offer um, care at um, really unusual times. So 24 hour care, overnight care. Um, when you look at the kind of when you look at the pandemic and sort of how the pandemic unfolded, what you found was that it was family child care providers um, who really stepped in to provide um, the care for um, a lot of uh, um, frontline workers, um, especially overnight um, and late, you know, kind of odd schedule folks. But we've run into situations where, in fact, the um, you know the state or the, or the 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 payer will sort of refuse a payment because they're like oh we don't you know we don't we don't recognize time that's on Saturdays and it's like well some working people work on Saturdays and so they need childcare on Saturdays and we offer the you know the care on Saturdays but the system isn't really set up for that or the system isn't set up to be able to do um, you know odd hours so there's a lot of systems pieces around family childcare that are disadvantage. Um, uh, you know, these providers. Um, another piece that I think is sort of worth calling out as a real challenge is there's a lot of grant programs, there's a lot of subsidy programs, there's a lot of really wonderful stuff happening um, for, uh, you know, available for child care providers. But if you're a single person who is, you know, running this, you know, running this company, and oftentimes these are folks who are running, even if you're just, you know, providing care from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., right? You're working from 6 to um, you know, to seven to six to eight. You know, you're working these incredibly long days, um, and the idea that you're going to you know have the capacity, have the skills, have the um, uh, you know the awareness to be able to apply for some of these grants. It's really you know the systems are really set up um, to be a real a real challenge. In fact, when CoRISE first launched in um, in Chicago. The you know the the idea that you could have a um, you know uh, you could run this pro you could do you could do this as a family child care um, uh, cooperative it was sort of like not within the regulations that you could even do it and so we were able to sort of adjust those in a way that allowed it but it was a real it was a real challenge um, so if you go to the next slide we'll talk about kind of like our solution right so what is you know what is a um, what is CoRISE? CoRISE is a child care cooperative of individual family child care providers. In Illinois, all the workers who provide chair, care under the, um, the child care assistance program, the state subsidized child care program, are members of SEIU, and those rates are negotiated on, on under a collective bargaining agreement. And so CoRISE is actually formed in partnership with the union. Um, in fact, their offices are based in the HCII, the SEIU offices in Chicago, um, and they have a really close working relationship. Um, the union has played a big role in helping kind of uh, um, help the co-op get off, off the ground um, and provides both kind of um, uh, kind of financial and non-financial uh, support for the um, for the cooperative, and so the cooperative is really you know connected closely with with the union and really trying to provide um, uh, you know you know kind of leverage that that existing relationship to help provide power you know um, influence for the um, you know for the co-op. Um, so what do we do? CoRISE, what does it do? It, it's a it's right now its main thing is it's a CCAP, which is a child care assistance program in the state of Illinois. It's a CCAP contractor, which means that it fine it basically pays the providers. Um, uh, it acts as a contractor to pay those providers that you know that fee. But we also were looking to 
Um, you know, we also provide, uh, you know, business training, business supports, um, and are off looking to sort of grow the number of businesses. If you think about what we're talking about here is each of these individual childcare businesses is its own, um, you know, its own business. And so this is kind of like a shared services or marketing cooperative like Ace Hardware um, that is, you know, taking small independent businesses and coming together to provide some uh, some you know uh, back office services and supports to help these businesses um, you know thrive and be successful, um, and so the the last slide just talks a little bit about um, kind of you know what we're thinking about in terms of um, you know how CoRise is going to be going. So it started about two years ago. It's it's relatively small right now. There's 24 um, families or 24 providers that are enrolled. Um, uh, it's growing pretty consistently, um, uh, but you know, a big piece of this is around trying to um, you know work with uh, with the state um, and with the city and with the union to try to figure out how to raise rates. Um, but I think another key piece here is that there are a lot of there are a lot of family childcare networks out there in the world, um, and a lot of them are doing really amazing and wonderful stuff. I think the difference between CoRISE and some of these other networks is what it does is it centers the provider voice in both the governance and in the kind of business decisions. Um, and by doing that, what you, what winds up happening is that sort of little things wind up being adjusted in in little ways to try to um, you know make this thing you know make this thing better um, you know for these providers. And really, when you kind of make business decisions centered around those providers. That business winds up being um, a much more responsive um, uh, piece, and it focuses on the things it needs to, but sort of drops the things it doesn't. Um, and so that was really where we sort of see the, you know, the kind of the key difference here in CoRISE as being something that, when it's owned and what's controlled by these providers, and the providers are really setting that voice. What it allows us to do is it allows us to build out systems and um, and supports that are really meaningfully responsive to those uh, providers' needs. Um, and so that, I'm going to turn it back to Mark. Very good. Thank you so much for that overview, uh, David, and and thank you for that important work that the ICA group is doing on behalf of uh, child care workers and uh, home-based child care providers. So now uh, we have finished with the panel of, of, of people, uh, cooperative experts, and now we'd like to turn it over uh, to some federal resources that are available. And if we're talking about child care, we need to include the Administration for Children and Families. And so we are fortunate to have Albert Watt here to talk about that uh, organization. Great, thank you, Margaret. And I know we're running a, a little short on time, so I'm going to be try to be qu as quick as possible. We give you a lot of information in that short period of time. So again, my name is Albert Watt. I work at the Administ Administration for Children and Families at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and really thank the, my USDA colleagues, the rural development colleagues, for inviting me to share some of our uh, what's happening at the federal level in the um, with federal child care and early early education resources and some of the priorities and opportunities that are coming up. So on this slide that you're seeing right now, the ACF, uh, just a word about who we are, we're home to a number of programs that support families. In the Office of Early Child Development, which is where I serve, uh, we have the Office of Head Start, Office of Child Care, Preschool Development Grants Birth Through Five, and the Travel Home Visiting Program. And this slide really just shares our mission and vision and priorities that we're all working on at ACF. And as you can see, our vision includes what we can, uh, what we want to see for children and families, but also more importantly, what we want to see for the early childhood workforce, uh, who are really critical partners for parents and caregivers as well. I do also want to flag that this mission and vision are also very aligned with two executive orders that were signed early in President Biden's administration: the one on equity and the EO on improving the customer experience. Those are issues that hopefully you'll see how we're working on these issues in the next uh, few minutes. On the next slide, you'll see that uh, our, prior, our top priorities, and not, I know this is a lot and it's kind of ambitious, um, but we want to continue. Albert, you're on mute. There you go. Nope, you're still on mute. I think I was muted. At, um, can you yep. all hear me now? Yes, thank you. Great, all right, sorry about that. 
Um, so as I was saying, these are the priorities that we have at ACF. Um, and, um, and I just want to highlight a number of them to you, to this audience. The first one, the very first one is, of course, um, you know, increasing families' access to early childhood programs, but also uh, priority number two, we also want these programs to be high quality, cultural and linguistically responsive, and also inclusive. And of course, health and safety, which is priority number three, are paramount to what, everything that we do. Um, and also compensation and pipeline issues, which is priority number six. We are really laser focused on those issues, including recruitment and career education advancement for the workforce. Um, and then finally, priority number eight is also worth lifting up. It's, it's really about, you know, how do we center the lived experience of families and providers and children and all everything that we do at ACF. Um, I like on the next slide, I want to highlight two important demonstrations of support from President Biden for early care education that people might be interested in. First, in April, uh, the president signed a sweeping executive order focused on care across the life cycle, young children, people with disabilities, and senior citizens. And really, this is a whole of government approach, meaning that more than 50 executive actions are to be implemented by HHS, you, uh, our colleagues at USDA, uh, some of whom are here, Department of Education, Department of Labor, the VA, Small Business Administration, and a number of others. Uh, we feel that it is very significant that almost all agencies are called upon to um, take responsibility for early childhood and really of note that this executive order focuses both on making care more accessible for families and supporting the care workforce, again, which is really aligned with our mission, vision, and priorities that we just reviewed and just goes to show that all the things that we do are really supported at the highest level of government. Um, the next slide shows the other major commitment that um, we've seen from President Biden, which is his proposed FY24 budget, where he calls on Congress to make a, a historic $600 billion investment in early care education, as well as uh, other discretionary funding increases for Head Start, Child Care, and the Preschool Development Grant versus five. So these new investments uh, would increase access to high quality child care for more than 16 million young children and increase access to preschool for all four-year-olds in the country. It would also improve compensation for the early care education workforce uh, to enable better uh, recruitment and retention. Um, again, this is the largest ever federal budget, budget proposal that we've seen in early childhood, and that really, again, demonstrates a strong commitment from this administration. Um, we know that also in the, out there in the communities, people are worried about the American Rescue Plan dollars and other COVID relief funding running out. And the president and vice president have really pointed to this budget proposal uh, to, uh, for Congress to consider uh, how, to con how to sustain those uh, investments. Um, on the next slide, we want to share some, um, a, a very exciting uh, initiative, which is our new National Early Care Education Workforce Center. Uh, it, this is a $30 million investment to support research and technical assistance for states, communities, tribal uh, nations, and local programs um, and territories to improve the recruitment and retention of a very diverse, qualified workforce across all ECE programs. Um, you can see the QR code, and if you go there, you'll see the landing page for this new center, um, uh, which will eventually become a more interactive resource hub. Um, the center will focus um, the research and TA activities on five policy areas that you see on the slide uh, that really make up a comprehensive strategy to strengthen the early care education workforce. Um, and you also see you know, on the slide the kinds of resources and activities they will be engaging in, and I encourage all of you to take a look at the website and to see what kind of resources supports uh, might be relevant to your work. Um, also, uh, on the next slide, we have, uh, we, we're glad to see that the impact of the COVID relief dollars in the early childhood education field. And you might, and people on this webinar have talked a lot about the challenges in the field in which conti they, they continue to be present, um, very present in, in the field. Um, but we do think that these funds have been a really lifeline to families, children, and providers alike. Um, so while the ARP passed over two years ago, and there is concern, again, these resources are running out, there is still funding available out there. Um, we know that the stabilization grants alone from the ARP have now reached over 225,000 childcare providers and potentially impacting as many as 10 million children. And to just dig into those stats a little bit uh, deeper, on the next slide, you see that states have been making incredible investments in the workforce wage, in workforce wages and benefits, and also making childcare subsidy program work better for providers and families. So they've been um, kind of uh, lowering the cost of childcare for more than 700,000 children's, family, children's families 
and nearly 1 million workers have received some kind of compensation increase. And these are just early estimates of the impacts of these dollars as of June of this year. And we know that states are continuing to invest and innovate uh, and, and make policy improvements um, for, you know, that would improve uh, children's families uh, and, uh, uh, and providers alike. Um, the, I will can share a link also to, 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 so that you can look, at, uh, look into these data and, and keep, keep track of how they are getting updated over time. Um, and then to sustain the progress that, that were made possible COVID relief dollars, the Office of Childcare just released um, a notice of proposed rulemaking with proposed changes to the Childcare and Development Fund. Um, and these proposals are currently open for public comment. Uh, you can read more about it on the o Office of Childcare website, and you can access it through the QR code, and, and there's also a link. Um, you see things in there that will um, encourage or require states to do many of the things that um, they have been doing with COVID relief dollars and many of the things that people have talked about today, such as improving access, increasing affordability, and providing financial stability for, for providers. Um, the public comment period is open until August 28th. And uh, please note that if you want, do you want to make comments, you need to go officially to the official website, the regular, really, sorry, regulations.gov website. So please do that uh, uh, through that uh, portal. And then finally, I hope you check out our own ECD website. Uh, which includes consolidated resources on key topics like early childhood workforce, mental and behavioral health, and early childhood facilities. Um, one specific resource that I think somebody already put in the chat is the uh, Rural Facilities Guide that was developed in partnership with our colleagues at the USDA Rural Development Office. So that's it. I know that was a lot. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put in the chat or contact me uh, through, this, uh, through, through the email or phone number. Thank you very much for the time. Very good. Thank you, Albert. And thank you for providing your, your contact information. Uh, I suspect there may be people following up. Um, so very, very good. Thank you for that. We are running low on time. If people are able to stay uh, for a few more minutes after our scheduled one and a half hours, that would be terrific. Um, I'm going to ask my colleagues at Rural Development, uh, their presentation on Rural Business Cooperative Services, that the uh, that the resources that, that we have, if you could be really, really, really brief and uh, just know that you can reach out to our team and we will get back to you uh, for more information. So take it away, Debbie Rausch and, and uh, Robbie Fausterfink. Hi, uh, good afternoon. To be brief, um, on the left side of your screen are our um, programs that we felt were uh, could be accessed directly by cooperatives. I will make a misnomer um, that the community facility programs is not in the RBS, RBCS section, but um, could be helpful to a child care center. Um, either they could apply or maybe the municipality where they live in um, could apply for that program. And Debbie, I'll let you go over okay. the other slides. And then the, the uh, links that you see on the right hand side of the screen are things that, you, that cooperatives would not directly be um, the benefit or would not directly be the applicant for. Those are grant and loan programs, but they are ones that could benefit from it. They are uh, intended to be seed stock for revolving loan funds. So this is a uh, would be gap type financing for uh, cooperative uh, daycare centers. So if you're looking for you know small amounts for equipment, uh, renovating facilities, those kinds of things, that's where these funds could come in handy. Um, there, each state has uh, revolving loan funds in their state, and they can guide you to who in their state can uh, can provide those. And then down at the bottom, you'll see the Rural Cooperative Development Grant link. That is uh, seed money that we provide to centers around the U.S., uh, usually about 29 centers uh, annually, that um, provide assistance to cooperatives and can help you get started. Uh, and then if you want to switch to the next slide, Robbie. Um, and that again is just a kind of recap of the revolving loan funds. We'll go ahead and flip to the next one. Um, this will give you some idea of the different types of projects that these types of funding will work for. Uh, so it, that you don't see um, child care on there specifically, but it is things like the small business loans, equipment purchase, gap financing that you would have uh, if you're working with a commercial lender, 
Um, and then there's some energy grants and things on there that could cover um, reducing the costs of operating through in, um, either providing better HVAC, insulation, solar, some of those types of things so, uh, that the centers can avail themselves of the REAP grants. And I believe it's Robbie, I'd turn it over. Uh, nope. Sure. Well, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Just, just, we'll just be brief because we can just yeah. kind of fly through these. <laughs> yeah. Um, basically, we wanted to give you kind of a, a little feel for what the co-op uh, section does. We uh, work with the centers. We are very well connected with the centers that provide technical assistance. We also have co-op development publications, which you can find both on the uh, Rural Development Cooperative uh, webpage or also through the Interagency Working Group's website. Um, and then we have some uh, presentations that we have done over the past um, year and a half or so, and those are recorded and those are also housed on the um, interagency working group. And then these are kind of links to some of the introductory uh, publications for cooperatives. So if you want to get a, just a background on that before you jump into whether or not it would be a good fit um, for a center to either transition to one or just start up a new one. That's some helpful information there. And then uh, next yep. slide. Yeah, and these are just um, our, our websites here. We're going to give these present um, this presentation to the attendees. So, you know, it's our cooperative services, interagency, and then our publications. And if you want to join up for Gov Delivery, and this one is more program based, um, you know, rural development or state con uh, state office contacts, um, business energy, and then an eligibility determination tool to make sure that the project is um, eligible for your area for that specific program. So, Margaret, I hope we've kept it brief enough. <laughs> yes, that, that, that was a very brief. So, uh, we we have a few minutes. If people are willing to stay on, um, I let's, let's go ahead. And if people have questions or if they want to make comments, uh, feel free to either put it in the chat or unmute yourself mm -hmm. and ask the question. You could raise your hand and I'll call upon you. And the raise your hand function is at the top, uh, along the top right hand right. side. And if you're shy, you can yeah put it in the chat. If presenters want to ask questions, oh, oh. Uh, Elias Krim, go ahead. Hi, thank you for some great information. I was taking notes uh, all the way along here, really good stuff. Um, about a year ago, a group of friends and I got very interested in uh, some work that John Ristakis did around social co-ops. And this was kind of a mystery to me because as I guess everybody here would agree, we don't have any. We don't have social co-ops in the U.S., not in the European sense. So, so I am part of a little team that's working on a study, a comparative study, um, sort of inspired by John's work, looking at Emilia-Romagna, um, Quebec, and uh, South Korea. Um, and what we're trying to figure, it's a feasibility study, and I guess our goal, uh, which we're still sifting through, is to ask the question, are social co-ops on these other models, uh, such as in Italy, for example, feasible? Can you do one in the US? How would you do it? Um, and you know, what other considerations would you have in terms of sort of location, industry, uh, you know, child care being prominent in this, in this group? And so one thing that I noticed uh, in research is, and most of you will know this too, is that in these other contexts, there are back-end organizations. There are consortia, as they call them in Italy, which make it actually a, a fairly easy thing to start a child care co-op. You're not on your own. You're joining a whole ecosystem, which seems to me one of the key missing pieces for sure. We don't quite 
have that yet, although uh, we're grateful to ICA group for uh, you know get, going down that road, getting close to that. And then the other piece um, um, I would say is that um, you know we w since we don't have models to replicate, you know, we, is it a matter of using the nonprofit model to come as close as we can in this country? Uh, would would that do the same thing? Um, the overall goal being just to address the fact that according to the data, the highest quality social care available in the world today is through these kinds of multi-stakeholder uh, organizations in a number of countries. But as I say, we're looking in particular at uh, the Emilia-Romagna region, Quebec, and South Korea. Just hoping anybody might have any comments on that. Thank you for that, Elias. Thank you for uh, Would anyone like to attempt to to address uh, social care, the social economy, uh, multi-stakeholder cooperatives being used in the social economy, and what it takes to really pull that off well? I'm going to put David Hammer on the spot because he's one of those forward thinking folks. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot. I think what you you put out a, you know, really, um, you know, thoughtful and important question, which is like, what are the ways that we can, um, you know, like, what are the ways that we can in the United States leverage some experiences from from other places? I think what's what's you know when i look at kind of the social co-op space in the us or not the social but sort of the like the equivalence of so the social co-ops um you see things like the um you know the sort of employment social enterprise space mm -hmm. um which tends to be more nonprofit um i think you know, to me though what what one of the key distinctions and the key differences there, and this is, I think, one of the things that Kim was was highlighting in in her presentation, is the the importance of um, uh, of stakeholder voice in key decisions. Um, that uh, you know, like when when I look and say, what's it like? What's the real difference between CoRISE and other networks? CoRISE is controlled and is or is accountable in a meaningful way to actual providers. Whereas in a nonprofit, if the if the members, if the workers are don't play a role in sort of selecting that, you know, choosing that board and playing that role and doing that, then there's not that accountability. But but as Kim laid out, like there's lots of ways to create meaningful accountability for stakeholders um, using the nonprofit model, using the multi-stakeholder model. Um, and so in that sense, I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a place where I think we, we have a long way to go. Um, uh, but I also think it's a place where, you know, uh, you know, I think the, one of the key, you know, especially in, in Italy, one of the key, um, uh, players in sort of setting that piece was the government, right? That it was a question around, like, it was about setting the policy that we're going to be trying to do this. And there were funds available. Um, and, you know, if we're talking about, uh, you know, trying to address the social sector in the United States through these these models, the amount of of funding that's necessary to you know to make a dent is I think is is pretty is pretty significant. But I think that there's you know time and again like when when stakeholders meaningfully have meaningful accountability or when an entity is meaningfully accountable to the stakeholders, um, lo and behold, it provides better services at lower cost. Um, uh, and um, because business decisions are based around kind of taking into mind, you know, th those stakeholders. So I think it's absolutely an area we need to be um, doing, you know, pushing more of, um, uh, you know, here. Um, and we've done a lot of work in sort of the nonprofit empl in employment social enterprise space at ICA over the years. And it's um, uh, when, you know, when workers or worker groups have meaningful say in sort of that governance. Um, the mission of that organization tends to be, you know, uh, by, by, like stronger, um, and those community connections are stronger. And that is something that really, um, I think, you know, drives um, innovation and quality. So I, 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 I'm grateful you guys are doing that, that, um, you know, that work, and I appreciate it. I'm excited about reading it. So.
And I think it also, I, I, David touched upon Emilia Romana doing that type of work and bringing the stakeholders. I, I believe the province of Quebec uh, took a similar approach uh, in, in identifying some key industry sectors that, that had some market failure and that had some market, that had, frankly had some opportunities and bringing together the various stakeholders, including uh, the provincial government uh, to, to put an emphasis on that. We here in the U.S. had a similar situation when it came to electrifying rural America. So, Paul has asked a question about um, uh, other programs like um, CoRISE. Do they exist in the United States? So there are there are a number of um, of groups that are doing child care networks, family child care networks. Um, in terms of cooperatives, there are not a lot. There are two that we know of, um, CoRISE, and then a group called the Family Child Care Coalition in Philadelphia, with a slightly different focus. Um, but there are groups around the country that are doing, you know, some really interesting and exciting work around, fam you know, shared services networks. Um, I think some of those are doing, you know, have, you know, have a really um, kind of a system in place to 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 have meaningful accountability from uh you know from providers. Um, so it's a it's it's a catch as catch can. Like some of them, I think, are doing you know really amazing stuff, and some things are doing you know amazing stuff with 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 provider voice. Um, it's hard to know from the you know from the from the outside sort of what is the you know what is the role of of provider voice in. Um, in shaping those um, those systems, and that's you know that's kind of what we like about the cooperative model is if it's a cooperative of providers, um, you know, and maybe other stakeholders as well. But it's a cooperative of providers, then you know at a minimum, you know, you've got you know providers uh, uh, playing a role. But there's but there's it's a it's not, there's not a lot. It's certainly an area we want to be doing more of. So, uh, Albert, go ahead. Yeah, I was I was curious to um, this is fascinating because it's not an area that I have um, dug deeper into that deeply into. I was wondering if David, in terms of those these family child care um, cooperatives uh, and and how they center the the interest of, of the providers, how important it is for there to be a union presence. I know there's Chicago when you said they would develop with a partnership with unions. Is is that is that necessary or is that something? Nice to have, but not critical. I would say that it's 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 a it's a nice to have. I don't think it's absolutely necessary. So in the case of of Illinois, the the so the the benefit that we had with with CoRISE in Illinois was that as CoRISE has been hiring staff, the there was a real push to hire only people with experience having been a family child care provider. And so what CoRISE was able to do was it was able to advertise those jobs to the 8,000 family child care providers that SEIU represents um, and only those folks. And so all the folks who work at CoRISE have direct experience having been a family child care provider. Um, so we have sort of, you know, in that sense, the union relationship gives them an unfair advantage, I think, over other other folks. So it's great. Um, but it's certainly not, um, a, I wouldn't describe it as like an absolute necessity. Um, uh, in fact, the other group that we work with, FC3 in Philadelphia, is, um, you know, it does not, they they have a connection um, through to a to a union, but not but not in um, in any in any in any kind of the same deep way. So um, it's more about like, let's be um, opportunistic and 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 try to seize upon whatever relationships we can um, is is really you know the 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 sort of what drove that. So very good. Thank you for those observations. Um, I am not sure. Are there any other federal agencies on the call that would like to uh, to say a word? We had Dr. Joseph Blassie on the on the call, and unfortunately, he just left. Uh, he just left. It would have been nice to have had him. Uh, he's out of Rutgers University and also uh, at at Treasury. Yes. So uh, yes. So, uh, anyhow. So um, you know what? I'm going to um, I'm going to put Kim Coons on the spot to give a final word because uh, Kim has been. 
act, has been active in the field of childcare and and cooperatives for many decades, and I think it would be helpful for her to uh, to give us some final thoughts. Oh, thank you. What I want to say is that I think there's a lot. I am really happy that there are so many people interested and in, and in attending this uh, program. And to say that there's a lot in the works. Uh, uh, Charlotte uh, from the university, from the Center of Cooperatives at um, Nebraska, and uh, and I are working together on developing a video, funded with USDA Rural Development funds, um, about childcare cooperatives. And I think these videos like that are really, really helpful, especially when you can see kids and you can see programs. So I think there's a lot of stuff in the works, and hopefully, let's keep this going. Let's get more uh, information and more development in the works on on these co-ops. Very good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending. And we invite you, uh, please know that this, this meeting has been recorded and the slides are have been compiled and it will all be available on the Interagency Working Group for Cooperative Development. Um, it may take a few days to get the, the recording up, but it will be there and for posterity. Uh, we would invite you to join us for the Real Estate Investment Cooperative Discussion that will be happening on Friday, September 15th. And uh, we've got some great examples of, from the co-op community and looking forward to a fruitful discussion with uh, sister agencies in the federal family. So thank you everyone for your time. Thank you to our speakers, wonderful job. Have a good weekend. Thank you everybody.